we're very excited to have you here tonight. Um, before we begin, I want to give you a little rundown of what's going to be coming up. Our next event is going to be New England Pirates. I don't know what the name is, Stephen O'Neill from Suffolk University. He'll be here doing a talk on pirates. Then Matt Brown will be here in Bay, and he'll be doing Situate 101. From what I understand, is everything you thought you knew but don't know. <laughs> and that should be interesting with Matt. Matt, don't mm -hmm. that one. Um, on June 7th, we're going to have the power and peril of celebrity, the Lindbergh kidnapping. And that's going to be presented by um, historian, <coughs> excuse me, Gary Highlander, which I know some of you know him. Um, then June 9th, we are going to have our, our Arts and Antiques appraisal event, which we had last year. It was a huge success. Um, that's done by the Plymouth Exchange. 100% of the proceeds from the event comes back to the Historical Society. Then on June 18th, we're going to be going on the road down the street to the Untold Brewing. And we're going to do a, um, a program, again, with Gary Highlander on Prohibition. Perfect spot for it at the new brewery down on Country Way. July 26th, we'll have Diving with Forest Queen Shipwreck with um, Debbie Jackson, Tom Malloy, and Hank Lynch. And they're going to bring bringing in some artifacts that they have brought up from their different dives. August 1st, we'll have Fred Freitas, a local historian. He'll be doing a program all about Hummer Rock. And September 13th, we have the Coconut Grove Fire. <coughs> Excuse me, with Stephanie Scrub. There are some other events that will be added to this. They're just not on this poster at this time. If you check out the Facebook page for the Historical Society, they'll be always giving updates. Some of the things we're working on is an event called Lines of Fire, which is a staged reading of actual letters from war, starting the earliest one is dated back to the Civil War. There was a, a cast of actors who come in and pretty much sort of weave a story with all of these letters. And then at the holidays, we're thinking of doing a radio broadcast, an old time radio broadcast of Christmas Gap, which will be with sound effects, you know, the old, you know, the sand and the breaking glass and all that stuff. So those are a few things. And we've got some other talks on different subjects as well. So again, thank you for coming. Thank you for your support of the Historical Society, please visit their website, visit our Facebook page, like the Facebook page, sign up for the emails. And um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Vicki Stevens, who is the director of the Hull Life Saving Museum. Vicki is nice enough to come out here tonight and give this talk on Joshua James. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. So um, let me know if you can hear me or if you can't hear me sometimes. Um, so Joshua James is sort of the key historical figure. Oh, it might be loud enough without it. It's okay without it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm just going to tell a little bit about the background of the Hull Life Saving Museum, which was the Point Allerton uh, Life Saving Station in Joshua James who is the most famous of the lifesavers from our station, although there were many, many families who were a part of it, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So I love this map. It's a 1795 map of Hull uh, that's in the Massachusetts State Archives. And I just really love it because it gives you a sense of just how completely surrounded by water Hull is, and the idea that everybody in the 18th century and 19th century in Hull, anyone who lived in Hull was deeply connected to the water. Everybody made their living on the water. Everybody traveled by water. <coughs> and the section where you can see the meeting house at the very end of the peninsula is Hull Village. Uh, so that is actually uh, now the most remote section of town. I know that I, I work down in Hull Village at the outer end of the peninsula, and I'm always really relieved when I have a meeting or something that's at the close end of the peninsula and I don't have to drive that extra 10 or 15 minutes all the way down. Uh, but in the 1800s, that was considered the center of town. And the reason that the far end of the peninsula was settled first and that's where everyone lived in the early days is because it was so close to Boston by water. 
Um, so even today, if you drive out you know, to our museum from Boston, it's going to take you at least 45 minutes, maybe an hour, but you can do it in 20 minutes by boat. Um, so that's why that was settled so early, and that's where all the lifesavers lived in that little section that says Meeting House, where the church is. And this is another uh, map of Hull Village, and I'm going to bring a pointer about that. Joshua James lived in sort of what would be the lower right-hand corner of the map, um, which is now called James Avenue and James Landing, and it's where he and all his brothers spread out and had their homes. Um, and this is just a great illustration of the role that life-saving played in the community of Hull. If you go through those little houses that are all labeled, you'll find the Galliano family and the Mitchell family and the Dill family, um, the Pope family, and almost all of them, at least every other house is the family of a volunteer lifesaver. So it was just a huge part of the community identity. Um, in the late 1900s in Hull, there were about 300 year-round residents, and that included men, women, and children. And out of that group of about 300 people, they earned at least 50 medals for life-saving over about a 50-year period. So um, it was just part of, part of the culture of who they were. Uh, so this is young Joshua James. We don't often see him looking like that. This is one of the rare photographs of him with his wife, Louisa. He was born in Hull in 1826 and spent his whole life there. He came from a family who was the youngest of five brothers, all of whom made their living on the sea. Um, and he had a tragic uh, childhood event where his mother sailed to Boston for the day on a sloop called the Hepzibeth that was old, owned by his older brother, Rainier. And just as common as any of us driving into Boston for the day, they had sailed into Boston and as they were coming back through Hullgut, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Hullgut, it's a pretty treacherous um, current through Hullgut, the sloop capsized and no one was able to reach the family in time. So even though they were only about less than a mile from the James family home, his mother, his baby sister, and an infant niece all died in the um, capsides of the Hepzibeth. So it was truly a tragic event. Uh, his older sister, Catherine, raised him from that point, and she's quoted as saying that ever after, he seemed to be scanning the seas. Um, he probably would have gone on to become a volunteer lifesaver with the Humane Society anyway, because his older brothers were and his father were. Um, but at that point, uh, it seemed to really be a life-changing event when he decided to truly dedicate his life to life-saving. Uh, so when he was about 15 years old, he joined the Massachusetts Humane Society. And I know that Situate has a lot of Humane Society history as well, so probably many of you are familiar with it. It's really a fascinating organization, uh, founded in 1786 uh, by a group of Boston doctors and philanthropists. And, uh, they were in part interested in uh, shipwreck survivors because they were interested in early forms of resuscitation and how shipwreck victims could be revived. Uh, the story goes uh, that they were also formed in response to a tragic shipwreck on Lovell's Island, where 13 crew members were wrecked on Lovell's Island and made it onto shore, but because it was winter and there was no shelter on the island, they all froze to death. Um, and people felt it was such a tragedy. I mean, Boston at that time was already a thriving city, and that they could be as close as Lovell's Island is to Boston um, and have to die for lack of assistance, essentially just freeze to death. Um, so one of the things that the Mass Humane Society did, um, quickly, this is one of the Hull Humane Society crews. You can see Joshua is the second from the left in the rear. Um, his brother uh, Samuel is in the front, who looks just like him, <laughs> and of many of the other men who are in the crew. So just to go back, one of the first things that the Mass Humane Society did after they were founded was to begin building these huts of refuge. They were just very simple shelters for shipwreck survivors if they could make it to shore. Um, so the first one was built on Lovell's Island, and the next two, as I understand, were built on Nantasket Beach, and then eventually they had them all along the Massachusetts coastline. And in the beginning, we'd be just stocked with basic supplies, um, you know, so that if shipwreck survivors could make it to shore, they would find shelter, they might find firewood, dry clothes, and then eventually they um, moved on and started to fund surf boats. So this is a rare picture of um, our surf boat, Nantasket, which is in the museum's boat room, being launched. There's only, only two pictures I know of of the surf boat, Nantasket, actually in the water. So this is one of them going out to the Lucy Nichols during the Portland Gale in 1898. So the Humane Society trustees would fund the boats, fund the equipment, and then they would organize crews. 
um, and Joshua and James eventually. He started when he was about 15. He jumped in with one of the Hull Humane Society crews going out on a rescue. And he continued for the rest of his life. So by the time he was in his early 60s, he had become the keeper of the Hull Mass Humane Society boathouses and boats. And this is a great uh, Boston Globe article from 1904 that's um, talking about the history of the Humane Society, which by that point was already an old and venerable institution. Uh, it's the same group of philanthropists who also founded Mass General Hospital and McLean's Hospital and the Floating Hospital for Children. So um, it's really amazing what an impact this small group of um, philanthropists had on the city of Boston and, um, and eventually on the Coast Guard as well. On the right side is a image of uh, just a detail of our Boston Harbor shipwreck map. So you can see Boston Light is near the center, and then the line that goes across, uh, Hull is at the bottom of the screen, and then Boston Light above it. And that line is Nantasket Roads, which was the main shipping channel into Boston until about 1902 when President's Roads was dredged. Uh, so Nantasket Roads is the only natural shipping channel into Boston Harbor that's deep enough for large vessels. So throughout the whole great age of sail, all of the ships had to come through Nantasket Roads, which is between Stony Beach, where our station is, and Boston Light. And then you can't see it on this chart, but then they would um, thread the needle through the narrows between Levels and Gallops Island, which is about a quarter mile passage that's navigable. Um, so ship's captains knew that there was no way they were going to make it through the narrows in any kind of foul weather. So they would often um, try to wait out the storm off Stony Beach or Point Allerton before trying to attempt the narrows. And all of those red ships are shipwreck markers. So, um, and that's just a section of the chart. So it gives you a sense of how many ships wrecked out there around um, the coast of Hull and the Boston Harbor Islands. There are at least 75 on this chart, and uh, there's many more beyond that. So this is the Symphonia Tasket. It's the most um, famous and one of very few remaining Massachusetts Humane Society served boats. It was designed by Joshua James' brother Samuel in 1887 um, and funded by the Massachusetts Humane Society. It was built at the Lolly Yard, um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It began, I think, in Situate before it moved into Dorchester and South Boston. Uh, so the story goes that when the Mass Humane Society trustees first looked at the plans that Samuel James had put together for the Nantasket, they really didn't want to fund it. They thought it was too heavy, it would be hard to launch and hard to maneuver, um, but Joshua James and Samuel James both really advocated for the boat. They felt that they had grown up in those waters, they really knew exactly what they wanted, and it turned out to be um, one of the most successful uh, life-saving boats in American history. It was used continually from 1888 until 1927, um, when it was finally retired. And we were very lucky. I think it was actually, I believe here in Situate, in a yard in Situate through the 30s, at which point um, it made its way down to the Mariner's Museum in Virginia, and was stored in Virginia for decades um, before our museum came into existence. At that point, the Point Allerton Life Saving Station was the Point Allerton Coast Guard Station and remained a Coast Guard Station until 1969. Um, once the museum was founded in 1978, um, Ed McKee, who's our maritime program director, tells the story of getting a call from the Mariners Museum saying, would you like your boat back? Uh, they were very happy to say yes. <laughs> so, uh, um, one of the cool things when the boat did come back, Daly and Wanzer, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Daly and Wanzer Moving Company, they, uh, they're up at our end of Hall and they've been in business for over 100 years. So they existed when Joshua James and his crews were going out in the Nantasket. Um, and they have a collection of antique trucks, and uh, when the uh, Nantasket did come home, Daly and Wanza towed it through the town in a parade and brought it to the museum. And today it's in our boat room, so you can come and see it. So usually the crews did grow up to rescue, but they also used the breaches buoy, um, which I compare when we have school groups come into the museum, I compare it to a helicopter rescue today. Um, you know, it's basically the same idea of dropping a rescue basket down to the ship and lifting someone off the ship, except, of course, they didn't have helicopters. So they had to figure out how to get the basket or the breaches buoy um, out to the ship. This is uh, an illustration. It's really, I find it amusing that when you see breaches buoy illustrations, it's usually a lovely woman. <laughs> it was always never a woman or a child. In illustrations, it always is, but in real life, it was always like a a very experienced sailor who was out there, and that's who was out coming into port in the middle of winter. Um, 
So this is, it's really difficult to see, but you can see a man kind of coming off the mast at the top there. So the crew, on the lower right-hand side, you can see the men behind the rock. They're hauling the whip line. So those are the lifesavers, and they have the line on shore. And the line is connected through a pulley system, like an old-fashioned clothesline, um, and tied onto the breeches buoy. So the um, hawser is the heavy line, and that runs from the top of the mast all the way back to the beach, where it's connected to what they call a sand anchor, which are two big boards nailed together and buried in the sand. So the hawser carries the weight of the breeches buoy, and then the whip line is tied to a traveling block that rides along the breeches buoy, uh, rides along the hawser, like a zip line. I always hesitate to compare it to a zip line because the zip line is fast and easy, you know, and this is just the opposite. It's really grueling to haul it. Um, we do it with kids. We do it like 50 kids at a time, so um, definitely not fast. Uh, but the lifesavers down by the rock, they're hauling the whip line, and that would carry the uh, sailor over the water and back to shore. It was a pretty ingenious system. They even had a hawser cutter that they would use at the end. So once they had finished the rescue and brought everybody one at a time, over the water, they could send the hawser cutter out the same way they sent the traveling block out, and it had a blade inside. It's like a block that has a blade in the middle, and they could pull a line back on shore, and it would trigger the blade to cut the lines loose from the mast so that they could haul in all their equipment and not lose it when the ship went down. So, um, very simple but effective technology that they used. You know what picture that is? I don't think that's local. Um, I think that's just an illustration I found for free to use, but I don't think it's a local wreck. So Joshua James and his crew of volunteers really made their reputation in the great storm of 1888, which was uh, sort of, we used to say the 100 year storm, you know, we seem to be getting them like every two years now, <laughs> but uh, in those days this was the 100 year storm, which we would probably compare to the blizzard of 78 that really just devastated the coastline. Um, this is the H.C. Higginson which um, sank just off Atlantic Hill in Hull. If you're familiar with the condos right at the beginning of Nantasket Beach, there's a restaurant at the top of the rocks there. So the H.C. Higginson would have been right out in front of those rocks. Uh, it was a devastating uh, storm all along the coastline. In Hull, the volunteer crews rescued 29 men from five ships in the period of about one weekend, not even one weekend. Um, and it's really hard to get what that means across without reading the details of each rescue because each rescue could take hours. Um, the first ship to come ashore or to wreck was the Cox and Green, which wrecked almost right across from where the Life Saving Museum is off Stony Beach and Hall, right in, in the Antasket Roads. Um, and they were able to use the breaches buoy to take eight men off the Cox and Green successfully. Um, so they just finished that rescue. They're wet, they're exhausted, cold. And a messenger came and told them about the next ship that had wrecked, which was the Gertrude Abbott. At this point, they were really at the height of the storm. So they launched a surf boat called the RB4, the Humane Society Surf Boat, all, all volunteer crew, and rowed out to the Gertrude Abbott. And they were able to rescue everyone who was on the Gertrude Abbott and get them into the RB4, the surf boat. But as they were coming back, they were really at the most dangerous part of the, the storm. You know, the, the tides were very high, the winds were very high, and they were just being pounded up against the rocks. So eventually the RV Forbes, the surf boat, was just completely broken apart. They were never able to use it again. And both the lifesavers and the rescued sailors were pretty much thrown into the water. And townspeople, fortunately, they were close enough to shore that townspeople were able to come in and sort of pull them out and help them to shore. Uh, Joshua James called it a miracle that they survived. Um, and Joshua James, I must say, is the most understated uh, historical figure you can imagine. It's really hard to capture any of the drama of what he did in any of his quotes because he always sort of says, well, we went out, we took him off the ship, we brought him back. Um, so for him to say that it was a miracle really is saying something. Um, and he and his crew were awarded gold medals both from the Massachusetts Humane Society and from the United States Congress for that rescue. So that was just you know, the second rescue. Of, they still had three more rescues to go. Uh, on the next rescue, they wanted to avoid the treacherous conditions they had faced going out to the Gertrude Abbott. So they were headed out to the Bertha Walker, which was another three-masted schooner that had wrecked. And they decided to try to launch their surf boat from a more sheltered location. So they, uh, they did that, but that meant they had to row six miles just to reach the wreck before they could begin the rescue. 
and the log account is typically understated. You know, Joshua James says, well, it took a long time to get the men off the ship, and that was good because it gave the crew a chance to rest. So if you think that like, actually taking the shipwreck survivors off the schooner and having them leap into your surf boat was your rest, um, it gives you an idea of what the rowing was like. So they did, they were able to get everyone off the berth of Walker, and then I'm just going to go back. In the meantime, while the hull crews had been going out to the Bertha Walker and the Gertrude Abbott, Cohasset and North Situate crews had been trying to reach this ship, the H.C. Higginson, uh, but they weren't able to. They were trying to use a breaches buoy rescue, and it looks so calm. The water is glass-like in this picture, but of course, during the storm, it wasn't like that. And there was a great deal of debris around the H.C. Higginson, and they weren't the breaches buoy lines were being fouled by the debris, so they couldn't get out to them. Um, so once they finished the birth of Walker rescue, Joshua James and the crew went and got their new surf boat, which was the surf boat Nantasket that I had just shown you. It had just been built, never used in a rescue before, but because the RV Forbes had been destroyed, they had to use the new surf boat. So they went and they had it hauled down to Nantasket Beach, and they went out. And they were able to get up close to the Higginson, but because of all that wreckage in the water, they couldn't really get as close enough as they normally would to have the men jump off um, and into the surf boat. And typically what the shipwreck survivors would do during the storm while they were waiting for rescue, which is kind of a heartbreaking thing, is that they would climb up and lash themselves to the top of the mast, and that's how they would wait for rescue and hope that someone would get out there. It was their best chance of not being washed overboard. Um, one of the men actually died while lashed to the mast. Um, we had some of his descendants come um, and visit us. They um, didn't even know that their grandfather had died in a shipwreck until they found some information about him on our website and, and came to the museum. Um, but they were aware of these three men still aboard the H.C. Higginson who were alive. So they tied themselves to the lines that the earlier crews, the Cohasset and North Citric crews had shot out for the breaches buoy. Those were out on the ship, so they tied them to the line, thumbs to the line, and just threw themselves into the water and hoped that they could be rescued. So Joshua James and the crew just hauled those lines and pulled the men into the surf boat and were able to save them. And then the last ship, let's see, I don't know if I have a picture of it. Um, this is the Maddie Eaton. So the Maddie Eaton, they didn't actually really have to rescue the crew. The crew of the Maddie Eaton were able to walk off at high tide, at low tide, as you can see. They were pretty far offshore. Um, I love this picture of the Maddie Eaton because I feel like it tells the whole story of Victorian Hall because you have the shipwreck in the foreground and in the background you have the Hotel Nantasket which was what Hull was all about in the summertime. In the summertime, it was a wonderful uh, Victorian resort, and in the wintertime, it was shipwrecks and rescues. Where was the hotel located? Um, let's see. Yeah. It's sort of right in the middle of the public beach. If you know where the um, Nantasket Beach Resort is now, the big hotel that's on the boulevard as you go down, um, if you're familiar with sort of the public end of Nantasket Beach at the entrance to town, Yes, we pass those condos, the beach is on your right, and you keep going until you get to the hotel. Yeah, so this is more or less where the new hotel is, you know, it was, it was right about in that spot. So just the following year after the great storm of 1888, the U.S. government then decided to build a life saving station at Hull. Um, they had been building stations um, around the country for at least a little more than 10, maybe 15 years at that point. Um, and they uh, built this one, on, it's called the Point Allerton Life Saving Station, which is always a little confusing because it's actually on Stony Beach, not Point Allerton. So the men are always called the Stony Beach Lifesavers, even though it's not the name of the station. Um, so it was commissioned and the, the building began in 1889 and then officially opened in the fall of 1890. And there's a view of Joshua James and one of the surfmen in the boat room. Uh, the Lyle gun by their feet is the uh, line throwing gun that they would use to shoot the breaches buoy lines out to the ship. Now that they're a life saving service crew, and most of the crew were the same men who had served in the Humane Society boats. We have a great letter that Joshua James wrote describing, you know, this one's been a lobsterman since he was 12 or 13, and he's been in the Humane Society boats for 10 years. Uh, there's also a mystery dog who shows up in all the pictures, so we don't know his name. And now that they're a life saving service crew, they're in uniform, they have government issued uh, equipment. But they still continue to work at, with the Humane Society, which is a little bit unusual. I don't know if that happened in Situate, because you also have 
Humane Society crews in the life-saving station. Most places had one or the other. Um, Joshua James, only son, he had five daughters and one son. So his son Osceola took over as the Humane Society boat keeper after Joshua James became the keeper of Point Allerton Station. So they just worked hand in hand. They often had a mix of the life-saving service crew and Humane Society volunteers going out on rescues. Joshua James continued uh, as in the life-saving service right up until he died at the age of 75 in 1902. Um, one of the more dramatic rescues uh, later in his life was the wreck of the Elrica on Nantasket Beach. It was a three-masted schooner uh, that came ashore in December of 1896. So Joshua James was 70 years old at that point. Uh, they got a message that there was a wreck down at Nantasket Beach. And this is one of the few rescues, or maybe the only rescue that we know. The crew rode the train. So the Nantasket Beach Railroad used to go right by our station all, all the way down to Pemberton Point, the end of the peninsula. So in this one case, we know that the crew hopped on the train and rode it down to Nantasket Beach, uh, which was probably easier and faster. So Joshua James knew that the crew of the El Rico were really in poor condition. They were frostbitten and weak. So he did not want to wait for the surf boat to arrive. He sent some crew members to go and get the surf boat and haul it to the beach. But in the meantime, they tried to reach his buoy rescue. And they were able to get the line to the El Rico successfully. But the crew of the El Rico were just too weak. They had to have the strength and ability to climb the mast and bring the lines to the mast. And they couldn't do that. So the lines were out there, but they were useless. So in the meantime, surf boat arrived, and they tried launching the surf boat. The first time they launched, they were just immediately driven back to the beach by the surf. So they launched again. And Joshua, as keeper, would stand in the stern of the boat and use a steering oar to steer it. That's how those boats were steered. Uh, so you stand with a steering oar to steer out to the shipwrecked ship. So as they finally got underway on that second launch, Joshua James Moore was hit by a wave so powerful that it catapulted him out of the boat and into the frigid water. Um, I, I love to use the newspaper accounts from the time because they're so much more interesting than our newspaper accounts today. So there's a great article that says, a cry of sorrow arose from the beach when Joshua James did not surface and all thought that the keeper was lost. And it turned immediately to a cry of joy as he strode out of the surf and began directing the crew as if nothing had happened. So <laughs> he was a pretty rugged guy. So they decided that it was too dangerous to try to use the steering oar, you know, they did not that to happen again. So they fairly ingeniously used the lines that had been shot out for the breaches buoy. So some of the men hauled themselves along the line to get out to the ship while the other men rode. Uh, and they were able to get out there and save everyone who was still alive on board the El Rica and bring them back to shore. Um, so they received silver medals from Congress and from the Humane Society for that rescue. Um, and the El Rico crew came back and stayed at the station for a few days, uh, with the station that's now the museum. And there was another newspaper article that said the people of Hull had decided that the crew of the El Rico were the best looking shipwrecked crew that they had so far. <laughs> and they were really sorry to see them go. So probably the last of the really um, memorable storms in Joshua James' career was the Portland Gale, which I know was also a very devastating storm for Situate. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with it, it was named for the steamer Portland that was lost as it headed back from Boston to Portland, Maine, um, with all souls lost, and later located in um, Spellwagon Bank National Marine Sanctuary. In Hull, it was no less devastating. Um, there's those railroad tracks we were talking about a little while ago. Uh, it just, you know, the cottages looked like toys thrown around. Uh, there were seven ships that wrecked along the coast of Hull during the Portland Gale. Um, this one was the Calvin Baker, which was wrecked off Boston Light. And it, here you can see that Joshua James said the men were really in a pitiable condition because they were just clinging to the little portion of the forward deck that was left um, before Joshua James and the crew were able to get out there and take them off the ship. Uh, and this is a, a kind of a charming little illustration that was in the Boston Globe of the Calvin Baker crew getting warmed up back at the life-saving station once they had been brought back from Boston Light to the station. So the Captain Baker was more fortunate. The crew of the Abel Babcock was uh, 
completely lost. So uh, there were some ships that Joshua James later wrote that they didn't even know were out there. The snow was so blinding that they never even saw them until the wreckage began washing ashore. Um, this is the Henry Tilton. And uh, this one wrecked right out in front of the life saving station. I think, you know, if you come to the museum and park your car in our parking lot across from the museum, if the Tilton were still there, you could reach over the seawall and touch it. It was that close. And um, you can see the railroad tracks are right next to it. Um, so it really came pretty far up. And Joshua James and his crew used the breaches buoy to successfully take everyone off the Tilton. Um, there's that picture of them heading out to the Lucy Nichols. The surfboat and casket. And these are just a few. There are several souvenir albums from the Portland Gale, so these are a few pictures of, um, from the souvenir album. And the one in the center is one of my favorite pictures in the collection. So many of the ships that wrapped along the coast of Hull were whole, uh, coal schooners and coal barges. So that's a picture of children on Nantasket Beach who are, um, have rakes and they're raking through the seaweed to collect the coal that washed ashore from all the wrecked coal ships during the Portland Gale. Um, and then over on the right, you can see uh, the roller coaster. So that was a roller coaster that was on Nantasket Beach before Paragon Park. Um, Paragon Park opened in 1905, but there were some amusements down on the beach before that, including that roller coaster that was destroyed in the gale. So there were at least 16 lives lost along the coast of Hull during the Portland Gale, which was the worst loss of life, certainly, in Joshua James' career. Um, and there was a brief investigation afterward to make sure the lifesavers had done everything that they could, which they had. Um, and Joshua James was quoted as saying that they succeeded in getting every man that was alive when they started for him, and that they started at the earliest possible moment in each case. Um, but as I said, there were just some that they, they never had any hope of reaching. Um, less known is the role the lifesavers played after the storm, but it was um, true on the Cape with the Portland Hill as well. Um, you know, it's a sad role, but they were also involved in recovering bodies from shipwreck survivors. Um, we have several articles where Joshua James had worked to try to identify some of the sailors that had washed ashore um, from the Portland Gale, you know, publishing articles in the Boston papers listing tattoos or jewelry they were wearing or things like that so that if people were missing a sailor, they might be able to identify them. Um, and in the early 1990s, the Hull Historical Society had a marker placed in Hull Cemetery um, to mark the graves of all the uh, unknown sailors from shipwrecks who had been buried in the cemetery and had never been able to identify. So that's known as Stranger's Corner. Uh, so I just included this because I think it's a fantastic resource on the Portland Gale. We worked a little bit on this, um, but it's really a project of um, NOAA uh, um, that put together on the Portland Gale, drawing on resources from many different collections. Did you work with them on that at all? I'm not sure. Yeah, probably. So it's, it's called a story map, and you can go to portlandgale.com, and it has meteorolo meteorological information about the storm, it has historical information, it has postcards, and it has um, artifacts, photographs, so it's really, if you're interested, it's really a terrific um, central location for all kinds of information about the Portland Gale. So in 1902, there was a devastating loss of a life-saving service crew at the Monomoy Station in Chatham, um, where this crew of uh, Monomoy Station had gone out to rescue of the crew of a Portuguese, Portuguese barge called the Wadena. And they were able to get out to the Wadena and rescue the crew, bring them back safely to shore. Pretty uneventful. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes uh, crews of ships would try to get back out to salvage their cargo. They were under a lot of pressure not to lose their cargo. So the crew of the Wadena went back out to their ship um, and unfortunately had to be rescued a second time. And on that second rescue, when the Monomoy crew went out to rescue them, they got them into the surf boat, but the, the seas were still pretty rough and the surf boat was swamped by a wave. Um, some people say that there was a language barrier that contributed to the problem. The, the, um, the crew of the Wadena didn't speak any English, so that the lifesavers had a hard time communicating what they needed them to do to try to right the boat. Um, but sadly, all of the crew of the Wadena were lost, and all but one man from the Monomoy Life Saving Station crew was lost. Um, Seth Ellis survived because a local man was able to get up to him in a dory and save him. Um, so that's how we know it happened. And this was really devastating, considering the dangerous work they did. Um, a loss of an entire crew was very rare in the life saving service. 
Service existed as an independent service before it became part of the United States Coast Guard in 1915. So it existed from 1878 to 1915. And during that time, they had a 99% success rate for saving lives, uh, which is pretty amazing when you think they had you know, wooden pulling boats and blocks and tackle and cork life vests. Um, so to lose this many members of the crew was devastating. And word of it spread throughout the service. So just a couple of days after that disaster, Joshua James took his crew out on a boat drill, uh, presumably to practice what they might do in that situation. And as they were coming back to Stony Beach, they pulled the boat up on Stony Beach, and Joshua James stepped out of the boat and looked out to sea and said, the tide is ebbing, and he fell to the beach and died. Um, so he had, he had led a long and arduous life, um, but it was certainly a real loss for the life-saving service. Even then, he was considered kind of a grandfather of the service, so it was all of the Monomoy crew. Um, and Joshua James, within the same week, was pretty devastating. Um, this is Joshua's crew up at Hull Cemetery with him, and you can see they have the life-saving service emblem and the surf boat man casket made out of flowers. Um, a few years later, uh, the Massachusetts Humane Society funded the memorial that's on Joshua James' grave. Uh, which is inscribed, yeah, greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. Um, so today, Joshua James' legacy is honored by the Coast Guard in several ways. Uh, one way is the Ancient Keeper Award, which I believe they founded in 2001. So um, if you're familiar with some of the Coast Guard honoraries, uh, there's an Ancient Albatross, an Ancient Mariner Award, and now there's an Ancient Keeper Award. And that, the Keeper goes to a person who works in small boat stations, and it recognizes um, that they carry forward the traits of Joshua James in terms of longevity of service and leadership and character. Uh, so one person holds the Joshua James Award for the, you know, from the time that it's given to them until they retire, and then when they retire, there's a new Ancient Keeper. So that was, uh, Tom Bethlein, who had been one of our um, Hall CEOs at the Point Allerton Coast Guard Station, he was the commanding officer there, and then was later uh, at another, when he was down at Point Judith, he was presented with the Ancient Keeper Award. And then in 2015, the Coast Guard commissioned uh, the United States Coast Guard Cutter James, which is one of their legend class cutters, and that was just an amazing event to be part of. The museum was able to be on the commissioning committee, and our role was really to help the Coast Guard connect with the history piece and to incorporate that into the commissioning and to, um, you know, the war room of the ship and things like that, and also to connect them to the descendants of the original life saving crew. Um, so we worked, and, and I personally worked with the Coast Guard to reach out to the descendants, and we ended up, up with about 50 or 60 of direct descendants of Joshua James and the gold medal life saving crew who were able to attend the commissioning, so that was a really cool thing. And that's down in South Carolina now. This is pretty dark, but that's what the boat room looks like today, and that's a surf boat man casket. Um, that's uh, Master Chief Jack Downey, who was the first ancient keeper. And then on the right, you can see some kids doing a breach of buoy dip drill, which we do with school groups. They don't go over the water. We don't shoot the gun anymore. <laughs> but they haul each other up with the line. Uh, and there's the snow row, which we just had this past Saturday. It was a little... A little breezy, but uh, it's one of our signature events. We're really fortunate that when the museum was founded in uh, 1978, we had a building, and that's really why the museum was founded, was to preserve this building. The Coast Guard then moved on and built a new station that opened in 1970. The town had used uh, the life-saving station for offices briefly, but had left. So a community group got together to preserve the building and founded the museum. But at that point, it had been, it was basically a gutted Coast Guard station then. There were no artifacts, you know, so they didn't have a lot to start with. Um, and Ed McCabe, who's still a Maritime Program Director, uh, really, I think, had a brilliant idea at the time to um, preserve the lifesaver's skills and ethics as, as, as much as artifacts. Um, so very early on, they started an open water rowing program for youth and adults. Um, yeah. I noticed the swimmer. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was at the Maritime Museum Institute. Okay. The rest of the book with Thomas Lawson was saying. Oh, cool. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know which crew used that. Maybe. Tony Hall. Okay. Yeah. To row? Did he go? They wrote the other ship building from England. I think I'm going to go. It was at a museum for a while, and uh, that was 
when they went out to rescue the crew up the Thomas Lost Town. Wow. Of course, they all leave. That they did back in the Wow, cool. Well, I've got a picture of them in there. So, so they founded that program, which now there's, there are many more experiential education programs now, but back in the late 70s, museums didn't really do that. So uh, we were lucky that they started that program, and it's really um, brought a huge wealth of activity and life to the museum that we wouldn't otherwise have with both the kids and the adults. Um, just recently, Hull was designated as a Coast Guard city, which is an honorary designation that recognizes a long-standing and ongoing relationship with the United States Coast Guard. So we were really happy that they decided to do the presentation at the Life Saving Museum. Um, the shipwreck chart that we showed at the beginning is uh, we converted it to a website. So that's kind of fun if you're interested in shipwreck research. You can go to bostonshipwrecks.org and click on the wreck markers. For the earlier wrecks, we don't have a lot of information, but after about 1850 or 1870, uh, any wreck reports that we have, any photographs that exist, are all up on the website. And that the other picture is the shipwreck that we were talking about a little while ago that had uh, resurfaced during one of the storms in 2015. So that was, we think, probably a two-masted schooner sometime between 1870 and 1900. Um, from what we could see, it was hard to identify it beyond that. But um, it was out for a few weeks after the really bad winter, and then quickly recovered itself, and it's back under the sand. And that's, that's the end. That's kind of what we do at the museum. So thank you.
of service and the coverage really carries forward those values. So that's on April 20th at Black Rock Country Club and there's information on our website if anyone's interested in that. And are there volunteer um, opportunities? Oh, sure. sure. <laughs> no shortage of volunteer <laughs> opportunities. <laughs> Museum.org and send us an email and we can put you on the email list. 